Uh, we're going to uh, mainly discuss uh, non-malignancy cases, so it's going to represent mainly what we've been discussing since noon, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, some benign disease, and um, anal rectal disease as well. So those are my disclosures. Uh, case number one. So you have a 24-year-old guy. He's had three previous episodes of uncomplicated sigmoid diverticulitis. And these are based off of CT scans. Uh, he's been seen in the ER once of those, and you can see the treatment there. Let me just go down the line, because we've been talking about diverticulitis and SCAD and diverticular-associated colitis, and there's been a lot of debate, and there's some, uh, there's a clinical practice guideline uh, from SAGES this year that did not typically recommend antibiotics for uncomplicated sigmoid diverticulitis. Let's start with Ian down the line. Antibiotics or no antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis? Um, interestingly, you have to select your patients for any of these things. So there's a fair amount of emerging data that in the patients that you can treat as an outpatient that go home with uncomplicated diverticulitis that antibiotics might not make actually a huge benefit. Uh, in the disease process. I think you have to take it case by case. I think if you extrapolate that to the patients that are sick enough to come into the hospital, most of those patients are not the patients that were studied in those um, outcomes. So the, the, the next ASCARS practice guideline will recommend that as well. It'll, it's going to DCR shortly, that some of the uh, select cases of outpatient managed uncomplicated can be managed without antibiotics. Rob? I'm still giving them, but I know the data show that it, it's a very limited benefit. But I'm trying to give up my toilet training. Brad? Uh, yeah, I'm aware of the data, but like him, I still give them. Yeah. All right. Two against one. Uh, this patient was, up, David. This patient was me, and I got antibiotics, and sometimes I didn't. So you're still giving it? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't have my colon anymore, so I don't get them anymore. <laughs> yeah, just to, just, FYI. To be clear, I told you the data, but I didn't tell you what I would do. I actually still exactly. give antibiotics. So that's what the data shows, but I still give antibiotics. So everybody would still give antibiotics. Can I just, uh, like a show of hands, somebody that would not give antibiotics for diverticulitis, uncomplicated diverticulitis? Let's just say no fever. <laughs> just pain. CT science, yeah, CT findings, no abscess, no perforation, no bubbles. No white blood cell count. No white blood cell count. Hey, okay. can I just leave a marker? Yes, please. That you're definitely, we're all going to give antibiotics, and I feel the fulminant C. diff coming. I'm Maybe. I just, 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 just want to leave a marker. Let me emphasize um, that, he, you know, his white count was probably maybe 11 or 12 in the ED. He, his pain wasn't diffuse. It was localized to the left lower quadrant. His... Uh, symptoms resolved completely with these treatments, and uh, he didn't have any symptoms in between those attacks. So now we have some CAT scans, not very impressive. Maybe he has SCAD, like Ben said. Maybe we give some mesalamine, some VSL, um, turmeric. Those, those are his CAT scans. So not really impressive. Maybe just... Except for, except for the obesity. Except for the girth. Yeah, I'm glad you guys noticed that. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. So these are literally his CAT scans from those episodes. So we talked about the antibiotics. Most of you would give them. Are, is anybody emphasizing on getting, when, especially when it's a recurrent attack, that they should get some sort of IV antibiotics, maybe just one dose? No. Does that matter for you? No. I'm, yeah. Not based on this case in general. If you suspected SCAD, so there was no inflammation seen on CAT scan, maybe a little bit of mucosal inflammation, are you seeing any patients for this diverticular associated colitis? And if you do, how do you treat these patients? Let's start with David on the other side. Very rare. I mean, very rare am I seeing that. So I, I can't even comment. I've never seen it. I don't, I don't treat it. Can't okay. comment. Valid. <laughs> Misalamine and send them to a gastroenterologist. Okay. Ian? I, I try to send them to GI as well. I, I don't see that too much. I more see either an acute presentation or that chronic smoldering presentation that we talked about. But I'd send them to a GI doc. All right. So let's just pass on to a different topic and emphasize a little bit what Mark uh, talked about. Uh, when do you guys operate 
for uncomplicated diverticulitis? What are your top three things that you're looking for in patients when you see them? Let's start with Ian. I don't think the number of episodes is, is so much of a thing. I think the timing and the frequency and uh, how much it's interfering with their quality of life. So if somebody's had a few episodes over 10 years, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, if people are, we're speaking uncomplicated, it, when it really gets to the point that the quality of life that's taken away by the disease um, is getting up, we start talking about it. And, and uh, I think Mark Sun mentioned it. You have to know your own morbidity rates. How can I do this operation? What's my leak rate? What's my complication rate? When I start conceptualizing that the complications that are going to be caused by that disease are higher than the complications from my surgery that I calculate in my mind, that's when we start talking about it. I wouldn't do it for this guy where he is right now. Uh, I think uh, the theme is basically uh, right what Ian just said, but I think to, you, know, you have to listen to the colon. And this guy has made three trips to the emergency room in how many months? In six months? One, only one to the ER, two to uh, treated by in clinic. Okay, three but, about a year. It, but three attacks in a right. year where he's had documented recurrent attacks. Right. So, I mean, to me, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to take out his colon. I wouldn't hesitate about that. But, it, you know, it's up to him. And you saw those CAT scans, right? Well, I saw, I didn't see all that much inflammation. I confess from here, but I was thinking I just didn't have a good chance to read them. But if you tell me that there's CT documented inflammation around the colon, it's documented every time, and you really think this is diverticulitis, it's three attacks in a year, um, then I would tell him perfectly reasonable to take it out because this is likely to happen again. Uh, the old thing that you used to tell people, well, you know, your next attack will be perforative and then you'll have a Hartman. We, we, I tell people that's what we used to say. We don't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can think about it. You can decide if you want to see how it goes for a while or if you want to have it removed. You've done enough. You've proven your case to me. Brad? I would echo that, actually. But what's his BMI to start with? Are you agreeing with Rob? I am. I okay. I do agree with him. Uh, I would chat with him and tell him, you've had three attacks in a year. There's evidence uh, that says you're going to likely have another attack, I think 60% chance or something. Um, and I'd have that discussion with him. He's likely going to have another attack. I give him the risks and benefits. How much has it affected his quality of life? Is he a guy that travels to foreign lands? I get that all the time. That they go to Africa and they don't want to be there and have another attack. Right. So you got to know what he does, what his lifestyle is like, how much has it affected his life. He likes to life. play video games oh, on the couch. Apparently. <laughs> 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 but no, looking at his size, I'd probably look at him and, and say, Cheetos. if he has another attack, you need an operation. I probably wait, would wait it out just looking at him because he's a big guy. David, anything different? I think the only difference would be I'd be pretty um, ambivalent about needing an operation, you know, so the risks are just too low. Uh, for, for myself, I waited 20 years, mm -hmm. 20 years until it affected my quality of life. So quality of life is a big factor. Travel history, I think those are really important things, access to health care. And then, you know, if they wanted it, just like Rob said, you know, he has an indication for it. So I'm not against it, but I wouldn't twist the guy's arm at all. Right. Yeah. Don't put the microphone down. Let's go back now and just think about these four things. So does age make any type of difference? I know that the, the original BJS paper had shown that less than 40 was an influence factor. That was debunked in a certain way. And then there's a couple more papers that came out recently that uh, the virulence of the disease may be increased in younger patients. So age. You already talked about the number of episodes, the severity of attacks, but one, one thing that we see quite commonly here at the university, just because we're a large transplant center, is immunosuppression. I'm not talking about the person that's on five milligrams of prednisone. I'm talking about solid organ or liquid organ transplant patients that are severely malnourished, uh, immunosuppressed, and how does that make a difference in your surgical indica indications? I assume you're still talking about uncomplicated disease. Co correct. But in our practice, immunosuppressed patients, transplant patients get colectomies. That's, that's what we do. Brad? I, I agree with that. Um, we know that immunosuppressed patients are likely to have a major complication, so yes, I would operate. Is there anything you try to do before, any different type of treatment, especially in the immunosuppressed, before you pull the trigger on a colectomy? Not that I know of. I don't okay. know what you're Rob, getting at. Rob? 
You know, I'm, I've gotten more ambivalent about uh, doing colectomies on people on relatively low dose, transplant patients who have relatively lower dose immunosuppression. There are patients that have an attack of diverticulitis, they absolutely don't want surgery. When I was an intern on the transplant service, you used to get a barium enema, and if there was diverticulosis, they got a colectomy <laughs> in, in the good old days. Yeah. So I tell them that if, you know, that, that um, if they have an attack, there's potential for it to be really serious and terrible, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not really sure I know what the risk of that attack is after one you know, fairly mild attack. So I don't really put the, lay the hammer on them like I used to. That could be totally wrong. I, I had to just personally review this for a, a while back, and I think it makes a big difference in this population. If it's a complicated episode, then all bets are off. The immunosuppressed patient with the complicated episode, you probably should offer them surgery for that. The yes. literature is not very good in right. the setting of uncomplicated, and, and mainly because there's different types of immunosuppression. So if you have somebody with a single uncomplicated episode and they're on a little bit of prograph for a kidney transplant, does that really compute to a uh, 30 or 40 a day of prednisone? And honestly, it probably doesn't. So the literature is a little bit mixed. I think you have to individualize it, but uh, certainly the higher dose steroids, the higher dose immunosuppression, I would offer it as well. That's Actually, it. the literature, the Minnesota experience published by Janet Lee showed that there wasn't any difference, especially with solid organ transplant patients, if you waited and they had recurrent events. Yeah. They do have more recurrences. It can become more virulent, but waiting wasn't a major factor. Okay. When do you recommend a colonoscopy? Let's forget about the immunosuppression, all those other things. Every patient, let's start with uncomplicated diverticulitis. Is, and they're uh, with a, uh, an average risk for colorectal cancer. Are you sending everybody for a colonoscopy or is it selectively performed in your hands? So I, I typically do after, a, um, after any episode of diverticulitis if they haven't had a current scope, but if you look a little bit closer at the data that we, with the uncomplicated patients, probably going to find a cancer in there one to two percent of the time at most uh, with a complicated case that's going to be a lot higher and i would definitely recommend it after a complicated case rob everybody one everybody two, one to two percent is plenty that's a good yield what the heck <laughs> life is easier you know I, I one of my great bad weaknesses is I, I try and think about things all the time and it makes me confused. So if you can come up with a simple rule, <laughs> your life is so much better. So just, you know, it's just a damn colonoscopy. That's a big deal. Just do it. Uh, certainly with complicated, I would do it, but uh, I forget who published the paper recently, the last right. time. It was low yield, Bowie. high cost. Right, Don, Don Bowie. Bowie that Don said Bowie. that you should only do it in the age group that would otherwise get colonoscopy. Right. So uh, you don't have to do it on every patient who, who has uncomplicated diverticulitis, especially. We have an epidemic of colon cancer in young people well, going on now, doctor. Uh, I, you, it's hard to argue with Bowie's data. Okay, now you guys are not agreeing. This is good. Yeah. I say just do it. Yeah. Six weeks. How long do you six wait? Six weeks, six to eight weeks six after. Weeks. The audience wants to know. Six to eight weeks, everyone? Yeah. You're okay with that? Okay, well, he has a normal colonoscopy. Uh, so we're feeling good, he goes home, he's not having any problems. A month after, he starts having umbilical drainage. Uh, comes back to the ER and gets a CAT scan. Ooh. So he hasn't lost any weight. <laughs> there's contrast in the bladder, and there's a little bit of air in the dome. There's this little kind of linear structure that's heading towards the midline here. And on a sagittal, you can see something not directly on the colon, but it's on the dome of the bladder, and it's heading upwards to where his umbilicus is. You can't even see his umbilicus there. It's probably over here. <laughs> so he gets examined by a primary care doctor who sends him to a urologist, and the urologist does a cysto on him, doesn't see anything. Um, he doesn't have a white count, he's not febrile, he has zero pain, he's eating normal, he's pooping normal, but he has feculent drainage from his belly button. Everybody who wants to operate? And you scoped him already and made sure he doesn't have cancer. Right, normal colonoscopy. 
That was before the drainage, but it could have precipitated the drainage, yeah. if anything. Nothing. No new material. Yeah. He's no venting it out his belly button. What was that? He's just venting it all out his belly button. Right. The blowhole. The blowhole. Yeah. yeah. Who doesn't blow, want a blowhole? So what was that? A blowhole umbilicostomy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Yeah. Staple that. Who doesn't want to operate? Nobody. All right. How are we going to do this operation? I don't want to operate. I want you to operate, Wolf. Right. <laughs> I'll send it to Ben. <laughs> I was talking about a little bit of a different kind of fistula as well in that case. But, yeah, this is, this is complicated diverticulitis as long as you've proven that it's not cancer or some other diagnosis. So BMI is 56. You have to take that into account as well. Dr. Sklau, should we do a diverting colostomy first? No. No. Do not do a diverting colostomy. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad that was clear after your talk. All right, so everybody's, uh, any specific approach? Robot. Robotic, I heard over there. Robotic. Okay, some type of minimally invasive. Everybody put stents in in these cases? When do you put in stents? Pretty rarely. Um, I use ICG if I'm gonna use it um, in the UO, and it stays for about two, three hours, potentially. And that's only if they've got complex, complex fistula to the bladder. And if I'm really worried about a lot of inflammatory change there and by cysto, they've got a concern. If it's way in the dome of the bladder, I probably don't generally do it. But if it's down lower, and this is, you know, in the belly button, so. Yeah. I'm gonna run this video, near. but I don't want you guys to stop talking. It's just to kind of get it going. But in general, uh, stents, so th there was a lot of there were a lot of adhesions. It was mainly omentum to the kind of umbilical area. So we're just taking down the omentum first. Um, his sigmoid colon didn't look that bad, to be honest. But why is it coming out of his belly button? So we're medializing the sigmoid. It's already kind of retracted for us. The sigmoid's stuck down in the pelvis. That's why the IMA pedicle is so inferior. But we have this cord-like structure, as you saw there, going down towards the sigmoid. And I was like, well, what is this? Right. It's a cholourachal fistula in a, in a morbidly a obese patient. What was that? With a BMI of 56. Wh of course. Yeah. Why not? Right. Um, let me just advance it a little bit. So uh, pretty stuck. So did everybody say about stents? Everybody's kind of doing it selectively, it sounds like. So we keep on taking things down. Getting smoky. We're charring things. It looks like there's an end to that. But I, I don't, you guys see anything connect to the bladder there? Take down the splenic flexure. That wasn't easy. I don't know how you guys do your robots, but with this intracorporeal, we just make a linear colotomy. We put in the anvil, and then I suture the colotomy closed, and then we staple after that. And I, we always use ICG to make sure that what we're leaving behind is has good microvascularization. Uh, so we went through the corner there to have one intersecting staple line. That's just the way the EA went up, and it looked good. So this is a side to end. It's just easier to put the anvil in. So what we're doing, I would highly recommend that you have this kind of in view of the scope. When you have somebody from below, you're on the robot console, you can see what's going on the whole time. You know, people, when they're, when they're not inflating well, or the fellows from below, and they're, you know, you have to tell them to look at things appropriately. Let me go back a little bit. All right, so we are bubble testing there. We're doing great. Everything looks awesome. What's that? It's a hole in the bladder. You could see. Remember it on, when we went you could back? See it on the video. See that area right earlier. here that I was charring? Yeah. Right there, that's bladder. Yeah. Connected to the urachus. 
So we've got a big hole in the bladder now. <coughs> See that there? Little hole in the bladder. Well, it's not, so bad. It's not too bad. Hole. All right. So we close that in two, um, in two layers. Question on, because uh, this differs depending on who you ask. What do you guys do after this? Foley catheter, do you send them home with the Foley catheter? Do you get a cysto after this before taking it out? Why don't we just run down the line what you guys normally do when you have a hole in the bladder and you fix it primarily? After I take down a colo fistula? Right. <laughs> I tested it with methylene blue there and I put a gauze inside and I distended and there was no leak and then, but what does everybody do after this? Just send them home with the Foley, test it? Five, five days of uh, Foley catheter and then take it out. You, any cystogram, anything like that? No. Five days, CT cysto, and take it out. What if it's positive? Leave it in. Okay. Do you repeat the CT cysto? Probably in another week. Maybe when? Leave it in two weeks total. Two weeks? Okay. Yeah. And then repeat the CT cysto. I don't Never. know. I still do it. You leave it in, Ian? Yeah, I was just saying, I still do all that Brad said. It's never positive, but right. I still do it. Right. Rob? Uh, I usually, I, I usually I'm not doing it, and then the fellow says, don't you want to get cystogram? And then I get superstitious, so I say, okay, let's do it. All right. So he, Same conversation every time. Yeah. You know, these, these patients do so well that they want to go home, usually day two or three. So I just do a cysto uh, when they're ready to go home, and I send them home. And if it's negative, I just take it out before they leave. Um, before five days. I don't keep it in for five days, that's for sure. Questions about this from the audience? But that's, you know, that's much, that was like such nice looking soft bladder. I mean, that just that right. looked like that. So we didn't recognize. It's not like your usual diverticular colovesical fistula where you're kind of putting stitches into wood or yeah, if, you, right, if right. there's a big enough hole. So I think it depends a little bit on the situation. Right. So this was the fistula from the colon to the arachis. And uh, there, there's like an instrument in there. There was no malignancy, final path, just so diverticulitis. What did you do to the I left it open, and it drained for like a week, and it just dried up. Uh, oblique. I do them oblique. I can show you. Uh, I have another one on that. Okay, next case. No more nightmares. 43-year-old lady uh, presents with a six-month history of diarrhea with occasional blood. She's had a 30-pound weight loss, and she was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And this was based on endoscopic biopsies, and this happened in February of 2019. She's from North Dakota. She has normal stool studies. It's mainly left-sided disease. They talked to her about biologics, because that's usually what uh, GI usually does initially, and she didn't like the side effect um, profile from them, and she said no to biologics. They put her on a steroid taper. She got a little bit better after that. She has no family history of IBD. She's had nine children vaginally, and about two or three weeks after she got on the steroids, she had a syncopal episode. They take her to the ER. Those are the relevant labs that she had, so elevated white count. She's malnourished severely, and she got a CAT scan. So these are representative images of left-sided dominant colitis with a phlegmon-ish type of process in the left lower quadrant, an abscess cavity on the outside of the sigmoid colon over here that's adjacent to the abdominal wall, and a lot of inflammation around it. They put her on IV antibiotics in North Dakota for a couple of weeks. Um, she gets a little bit better. They send her home. She goes back to the hospital, gets back on IV antibiotics. She spends like six weeks on antibiotics between IV and PO. She's not getting any better, and we get a call from the university that they want to transfer her down here. Of course, we say yes. What would you guys do? Keep on going with the antibiotics? When you ask her about the antibiotics, it's, it seems like they only tried IV antibiotics maybe for two days, and then they switched her right away to oral. Is there any benefit of being on parenteral antibiotics for a longer pro time? I, I'd divert her. I would divert her, and she's got a multiple problem. She's got um, basically looks like perforated disease. How would you divert her? Just an ileostomy. Okay. And then she's got such bad nutrition that doing a major operation in her is highly morbid. So if you could get away with cooling her off with a diversion, antibiotics, and then 
you know, trying to treat her disease, get her nutritional status back up, whether she needs to be on TPN or enteral nutrition. Um, you're going to have to improve that because she's, she's in a bad place right now. Brad? Well, this is an ulcer of colitis. That's my first thought. I mean, of course. Of course it's Crohn's. Right. Uh, I would put her on TPN right off the bat, put her on IV antibiotics, see if she gets better after a week. If she doesn't, I would divert her with an ileostomy, cool her off, sit tight. Right. The first day she's in the hospital, she's afebrile, she's hemodynamically stable, she's a little distended, but she has minimal pain. She's very comfortable. She's not toxic. Her albumin is 0.9. All right. Everybody agrees with TPN? Yeah. IV antibiotics? Yes. Okay, it's getting worse. The IV antibiotics are not working. Shouldn't, you should have listened to Dr. Larson. It's not too late to listen to Dr. Larson. <laughs> not too late to listen to Dr. Larson. It's getting a lot worse. The infection is eroding into her abdominal wall now. Maybe a fistula. How many days is this? This has been going on for three months, probably. No, but how long has she been getting the TPN and the IV antibiotics? Uh, six days. So this is just evolving before your eyes. Right. Bad. Very bad. So we already. T uh, so Dave already said diversion. Um, is everybody thinking surgery here? How toxic is she right now? None. Oh, so she's still. Right. That that imaging does not correlate with her clinical status. But she's not, she's got like, I forget what energy is, but she has it. Right. <laughs> right? She's, I mean, lost, she's, she's lost hair. She has That's got like, she she's got yeah. quashiorcor. Right. And I'm serious. <laughs> she does. And she, Rob has a I mean, slight advantage. You can't yeah. do a she's, major operation on her. Okay. Her albumin is 0.9. So I would divert her, like Dave said. with a laparoscopic ileostomy. So GI doesn't want to scope her. They don't want to start any type of therapy. No steroids, obviously. She's on TPN for at least two weeks. She's not getting any better. Her album is slightly better. She probably has an album of 2.2, 2.3 now. 2.2? Yeah, after being like 0 0.9. That's too fast. You can't do that. That's, that's non biological It's been two weeks. What do we want to do? Just send her home? TPN, more antibiotics? How long do you guys want to wait? No, she's, yeah, she's all, getting worse. I think worse. we all diverted so I, I think, her already at this point. Yeah, we all would have diverted her already. Not okay. too, waited two weeks. She still has a left lower quadrant phlegmon and an abscess. So what did you find when you went to the other Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make it too easy. All right, so we put her on some IV, well, on some TPN for two weeks. Her albumin got better. She was minimally symptomatic during this whole process. The medicine service scanned her like five times in one week, probably. <laughs> and the abscess just got more annoying as I looked at it. What do you guys think about that? That was that's what you did. That's what I did. That's okay. You're, you're so pretty, you're so I would good. like to know if you guys would do more of a segmental resection. What did the rest of her colon look or like? Because it didn't look all that fantastic. It looked here. The whole what? thing looked horrible. So it wasn't just her right. sigmoid, right? They all, not all of it looked kind of crappy. Well, right. I, I, I wouldn't I mean, leave it. I mean, she's got a... I would bring up her... She, she'd get a mucous fistula. I wouldn't close her rectal stump. And yeah. throw, right. I wouldn't throw it back in there. Hopefully you, have, you were able to leave some sigmoid so you could do that. I mean, sometimes the problem here is mm. that you're already in Falls below apart. the pelvic inlet and you can't even reach into the abdominal yeah, wall. I mean, but but right. generally, I would leave it above the fascia, potentially below the skin. And if, you, if it bursts, it's just open up the wound. Right. I, I think if you can do that, in this case, looking at that skin, that may have been the sigmoid itself that was perforated or, or forming that abscess in there. So if, if it was feasible to do that, Yes, but otherwise, if, if you had to just to resect that whole awful cavity that was in there, you may actually have to take that piece of bowel out. Right, that wasn't that difficult. The high risk stump. What was the diagnosis? So, the based path? on the endoscopic biopsy, she had CUC, and we had that reviewed while we were waiting. Mm -hmm. And it didn't show any evidence of Crohn's disease by the pathologist of my choice. Huh. 
So there was a small concern for a perforated malignancy, obviously. So when we were doing that mobilization, it was stuck. We sent frozens. We opened up the specimen to make sure we weren't dealing with the neoplasia at the same time. It wasn't the case. It was a stricture with perforation proximal to it. Now you've stapled at roughly the sacral promontory. Nothing's going to reach. To your to, and it, plus it's laparoscopic. So the whole specimen came out the ileostomy incision. So is there anything you guys do with the rectal stump, especially in these patients that have this severe malnutrition, when you can't reach to the fascia? Is there anything different? Do you leave a drain in the rectum? Anything? Um, if I do it, uh, over, I oversew the staple line, okay. and I we leave a drain in the rectum. Right. Yeah, I do the same. I oversew the staple line, I leave a drain next to the stump, and I leave a drain in the rectum. Yeah. The same. So abdominal and rectal drains. Yeah. yeah. Rob, you like that? Yeah, I like it, but I hate those rectal drains. I don't. So I, often I, I won't leave a rectal drain, but we'll go and like wash it out. To, you know, take a red rubber catheter and just rinse out the vent the rectum on the floor. But carrying that puppy dog tail around it's, down the hall is dis yeah. it's disgusting. It's hard to make them last it's long. It's just a yeah. Penrose. I don't think the Penroses do anything. No. So we washed Maybe out the, the rectal stump in typical Finney's fashion. A uh, little bit of betadine in it just to make him happy. And we start seeing some betadine coming out of the vagina. This is, yeah, what? This is All right. not now you, But now you've got it vented. And I can't, we can't. <laughs> I told you this wasn't rectum, The colitis. rectum is not going to blow out. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have uh, gallbladder cancer. Is Mark here? No. Okay. You guys weren't here for it. Okay, has a fistula. She does great. Goes home. She doesn't like her ileostomy. I told her you have to come back. We review the pathology again. It's pancolitis, ulcerative colitis. No evidence of Crohn's. You agree with that, Dr. Sklow? No. No. <laughs> no. I don't know what your pathologist was smoking. You were smoking the same thing, but this patient has Crohn's. I would not put a pouch in her. Don't even think about it. Okay, what do you want to do next? She's a month and a half out. What's her labs? What's her, her albumin's 3.6. Um, her nutrition is a lot better. She's taking care of her nine kids. Very active. Have you, where's the fistula? So on exam, in clinic, we can't feel anything. Might have been from the ninth kid, for all we know. Yeah, she, you got you to image her and figure she out She still has a uterus, right? Is. All right, so She's, we get an MR pelvis and an MRE. She goes back to GI. There's a concern for Crohn's disease, obviously. The MRE is normal, and the official read of the 3T MR pelvis show, says no fistula. Not even perianal. Right. So what do you want to do next? EUA. Yes. All right. So I take her to the operating room. She has pseudopolyposis of the rectal stump, and she has a low rectovaginal, almost enovaginal fistula. Her number nine, body, baby, number nine. Number nine. <laughs> her perineal body is disappeared, essentially. She's one of the thinnest sphincters you'll ever palpate. No septum. So now what? She says she had um, urgency, but no seepage or leakage before she had her, uh, in February when she had her diarrhea. Tatiami, proctectomy, intersphincteric resection, permanent ileostomy. Okay. So we review the pathology again. Take biopsies of the rectal stump when I did the EUA to make sure. And or still no Crohn's disease. Or send her to Dave for the pouch at Mayo. Right. <laughs> she doesn't have that purple hue that Dr. Goldberg describes all the time. What do we do next? We already know what Dr. Sklau wants to do. Let's go down the line. What do you guys want to do? She does not like her ileostomy. Teach her to like her ileostomy. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Teach, I know, I, I feel I know what's coming. But I don't know what's coming, actually, but I feel no, I know I what's coming. I literally haven't operated on it yet. You guys oh. are going to tell me what to do? Okay, teach her to like her ileostomy. Okay. That's going to be hard. Ian? Yeah. No, I think just because you can make a pouch doesn't mean you should. I, this doesn't sound like a great situation for that. I'll talk to her about that. 
So the question is, what about an ileorectal without a pouch in the setting of a rectal vaginal fistula, ulcerative right. colitis, possible with, Crohn's? With a diseased rectum. Yeah. Right. She'll like that a lot less, probably. But you, it's, you know, depending. She was, she was minimally symptomatic with this anal vaginal um, fistula, right? And she was having diarrhea before this whole process. Right. She's had nine kids. I want to know what Dave wants to do. Let's see. Oh, really asked me. I mean, I, I wouldn't be rushing to do another operation on her yeah. right now. I'd give her time and then come back, you know, six months down the road and see where she's at. Okay, she comes back in six months. She's doing great. And what is her, I mean, the things that I would be thinking about to me, if she's really absolutely can't live with an ileostomy. She can't then, live with an ileostomy. Then I would look at her rectum. It's still inflamed. Then there's really no hope. I mean, occasionally you'll have a patient who's, you know, morbidly obese or she's won't thin. live with an ileostomy. And, no, I'm not going to do a pouch with an anal vaginal fistula. That's, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Baby. Let me try to uh, persuade you a little bit more. Any option like this you like? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, the third one. Yes. Nobody wants to repair it, divert it, and try it later? And then try and make her continent with her pouch attached to it? <laughs> <laughs> She's got the thinnest perineal body in history? You just right. going to do a little wrap I mean, That's, that's wraps, the, To me, that's the problem. It's too low. You know, if you had a, if you had a vaginal fistula that's up higher, potentially you could take a pouch and rotate it so that the mesentery is up against the vaginal fistula, separate it, and maybe you could get below it all and do all this stuff. But if it's in the anus, you, you're not going to get... And she's a sphincter defect. Yeah, and she has a huge sphincter defect. I mean, I can't believe she's not incontinent already. I think it's she's It's essentially lying. a subcutaneous fistula, if you think about it. There's no muscle there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make it any better. <laughs> the, pouch, the pouch operation... In a normal patient is fraught with issues, yeah. and this, this person has so many strikes against him from the beginning. If you did a pouch on her, that's insane. All right, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Well, right. report back, Wolf's doing the pouch. <laughs> I, just, I just want you to know, next year, we'll find out how the, pel the pouch went. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Easiest pouch ever. 80-second course, update. 80-second course, the update. <laughs> All right, another person from North Dakota. 72-year-old, nicest guy ever. He'd had a total abdominal proctocolectomy 33 years ago for UC. They didn't find any dysplasia, any cancer, just had inflammation. Obviously, it's a pre-biologics era. And he comes in with a symptomatic parasomal hernia. He's been admitted every three, four months with the symptomatic hernia. Just down the line, um, what are the things you guys look at for and symptoms on somebody you're going to do an elective parasomal hernia repair on? And how do you do it? Just down the road, quick. It, like modify the risk factors, obesity, smoking, et cetera, Im immunosuppression, how symptomatic is he, obstruction, pain, et cetera, um, how big is the hernia, uh, and most of the cases I would do a laparoscopic sugar baker, but I would reevaluate that if the whole hernia site was just completely blown out. I might recite that one and repair the site. Rob? Uh, with my 100% peristomal hernia recurrence rate, um, I would, if I was really forced into it, I would kick the can, if, and I couldn't get somebody with a hernia interest to try and tackle it, and I'm, I'm taking my boards and everybody's away, I would recite him, which I understand is just kicking the can down the road, and he'll be fine for a year, and then he'll get another one. Yeah. 72. But I would, so, I mean... I would recite them if I had to do something, and I would just do make a peristomal incision, sneak it underneath, no laparotomy, yeah. just slide it under, make a new hole, and bring it up. Brad? Uh, we have the luxury of having two guys that do these at Abbott, so I would refer it. Colorectal but, surgeons or hernia surgeons? No, hernia surgeons, okay. abdominal wall guys. But if I had to do it, if I was on my boards, I'd do a laparoscopic sugar baker. David? I think the, the, fa the factors, I would drag my feet unless he's having obstruction. He can't keep his appliance on. I tried um, that. didn't work. Um, and then I would do what 
everyone else suggested here, except the, given his age, I would consider just moving, kicking the can down the road and putting it on the other side. Reciting? But for, but so we have for two people young reciting person, and two young, people young doing person, sugar baker. I would do a sugar baker or prepare. I wonder meal why this prepare. is not running. Just to get there. All right. So I'm in agreement with 50% of the people on the podium. So a lot of adhesions. Finally, we got around it. Uh, big sack. Very careful with the mesentery. Uh, pretty scarred in laterally. Let's see if I can advance this a little bit more. Uh, so there's a lot of bowel coming down here. Uh -huh. A little more bloody, but we've defined the defect. So there's a suture closure from the inside of the defect laterally, not too tight. No ischemia. They don't make this mesh anymore. Uh, it's the Pariatex mesh. That's the sugar baker one. So we do four transfascial sutures and then tack it. Uh, make sure that we're leaving enough space laterally for the mesentery in the bowel. There was no intraoperative spillage. The operation took maybe two and a half hours. It looked good at the end, as always. <laughs> but. So he's from North Dakota, he goes to another hospital with fevers and abdominal pain. His white count is 14. Right now he's post-op day, a little more than two weeks. We got a CAT scan, of course. He has two fluid collections, one in the right lateral abdominal wall and one underneath the fascia, more medially. There's some air bubbles in it. Next steps. Admit him and drain. So let's go down. So uh, Dr. Paquette said uh, admit him, IV antibiotics, I suppose, or antibiotics, yep. and IR drain, or, dra or you're going to drain him? I think it'd probably be just as reasonable to get an IR drain because you could have two. You could hit the one yourself over there, but you can have, you're not going to get the intra-abdominal one by yourself, so I'd have him get an IR drain. Rob? IR drain. It Knowing full well, they're going to say no, but IR drain is what I try. Still my thunder. IR drain, but I'm concerned of a bowel injury or something with yeah. that one uh, with the air in it. I mean, right. And that mesh is obviously a concern, but I'd start with the drain. David, anything different? No. All right, so they don't even want to aspirate it. What? IR doesn't want to do anything. Why? That's how we roll. Because that's how we roll. <laughs> I didn't think they had a choice. So these are the options. IR doesn't want to drain anymore. You kept him on antibiotics for a couple days. His white count's not coming down. You're still thinking about that CAT scan every day. He's not getting better. Um, if IR didn't want to drain him, what would be your approach to this? You get pus. Yeah, I mean, you have a long-term problem, right, because he's got a hunk of infected... Yeah. Mesh. mesh. Exactly. So So you get another cat scan Whoa. before yeah. somebody thinks. And I don't know if you can see this really well. So this medial fluid collection is a lot bigger. See what these little things are right there? Those Staples. are tacks. Those are tacks, yeah. They look it's like floating tacks. in a fluid Free collection. Floating mesh. Yeah. Now what do you want to do? You, you is go that back. thing on the bottom scan yeah. is that a urachus? <laughs> <laughs> You, He's related. Yeah, I think you tacked it to the urachus. Right. You got to go back. Take it out. How do you want to do that? Go back robotically, drain it, take it out. Robotically? Yes, because oh. you're going to show that. <laughs> <laughs> you know me so well, but I didn't. So we went back. So I didn't want to waste time with this. I knew that this was going to be infected. And we went up back on this case to see if there was any... Um, disruptions in the sterility of the case, if something happened, he got his antibiotics, he did well, we didn't notice any enterotomies. Did I didn't... Did you do a study for the ileostomy? Right, so I didn't mention this, but he had, um, he had a bit of swelling of his ileostomy right after his procedure, so I did an ileostogram with water-soluble contrast, because I wanted to make sure of two things, that it wasn't too tight, and number two, that, the de that I didn't have a missed enterotomy. And, and I didn't never, show that because it was going to be obvious. You never disconnected the skin, right? You what never, was that? You never disconnected the... Never. The He's not recited. No, we just took it down and, and reduced the hernia not sac. Not yet. Right. Did you No, I did not. I covered it with an IO band, though. 
Yeah. So um, we went back and looked at everything, and we couldn't find anything that could have contributed. And it's, you know, it may have been maybe a disruption of something. It is a peristomal hernia repair. It's a clean contaminated case. Um, so I took them back. I didn't want to wait it's any like more it, antibiotics. It, I took them back laparoscopically. Uh, it was kind of hard to get in laterally, left laterally. Uh, but we were able to get in. We finally found the pocket. It was really easy to remove the mesh once we cut the proline sutures. And we washed him out, left two drains. He was in the hospital for about three days. And I haven't seen him back since. Do we have time for one more case? What time is it? It's almost five. We got a break. OK, any questions regarding these cases from the audience? Yes, we have a question. Yeah, that's something I don't. Um, so it was personal preference, uh, you know, just doing the transfascial sutures instead of the tacker. Um, I, if you, you know, that when I did this case it was probably two and a half, three years ago. But uh, now I would suture. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, on the lady with the colitis and the fistula and who couldn't live with ileostomy. I mean, I personally don't do this, but would anybody send her somewhere to get you get a continent ileostomy? Continent ileostomy. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, Coke or Barnett. Well, let, why don't we ask the panel is about it, that? Was it St. Petersburg, Florida? Is they got the Barnett gurus down there? Yeah, she can. She can get a Coke pouch or something like that. You know. What are you guys typically doing? Are you sending them somewhere, or, or are you guys doing them at your institutions? No, we do them rarely. But you're you're keeping rarely. them in house. Yeah. Okay. Brad, Rob. I don't do them. No. I don't do them. I'll send them to Dave. Okay. Did that answer the question? There was one more question back there. Um, what did you do once you took the mesh out of that? Did you just leave it primarily closed? And yeah, I left that fascial closure proline that I had put in initially. The only thing I removed was the mesh. the mesh. Any thought of like putting a biologic mesh or something over that? Not at the same time. Things were really angry. There was a lot of there were a lot of adhesions. Um, and we did investigate the bowel to make sure we weren't dealing, leaving behind an enterotomy that was undrained. But we, we were able to see things good enough that there wasn't a missed enterotomy that we could see at least. And he did well up to two months. So if you would have had, a, if you would have had an abscess from a missed enterotomy or a fistula either closed on its own or just taking out the mesh, it was just a contaminated mesh. But we investigated to make sure we weren't leaving a hole in the intestine. Do you ever use um, a, like a biologic mesh originally on your first surgery with that? As Why don't we ask the panel, who uses, prof well, let's ask two questions. Who uses prophylactic mesh when they create a stoma? And number two, what type of mesh is the go-to mesh you use for peristomal hernia repair? Ian, why don't we start with you? Uh, no prophylactic mesh, and I would use more of a permanent mesh like that than a biologic, as long right. as it wasn't contaminated. Rob? Uh, no prophylactic mesh, and I don't do them, so I'm not commenting. Uh, no prophylactic mesh, but if I did them, I'd use a permanent mesh. Permanent. David? Yeah. No, no, pro no prophylactic. Right. So the uh, hernia guidelines from Europe do recommend prophylactic placement, typically recommend information of it. The United States guidelines does not recommend it. There's two, ra two three randomized control trials. One was... Um, one positive, two negative, I think. Fleshman's, one, right? Fleshman's uh, was negative. Negative. And there's Germans, one from Finland. Germans were positive. Yeah, that one was positive. But there's the two larger randomized control trial did not show a significant difference or an increase in clinically symptomatic uh, parasomal hernias when you place prophylactic mesh. Thank you.